All right, we're continuing Drop the Mic, our series where we're looking at some of the most powerful things that Jesus ever said, his sort of drop the mic sort of moments where the things that he said, people just left saying, Can you, did you believe that? That was crazy. And people have been talking about it ever since. I guarantee you after our message today, you will be talking about what we talk about today. As you've already heard a couple times, I want to just let you know that this is sort of PG-13, even R today, so if you've got kids with you, make sure you go check them into children's programming. Um, it's, it's a big deal, what we're going to talk about today. We're going to look at where Jesus talks about sex, lust, and adultery of the heart. Yay! <laughs> Aren't you glad you chose to come to church today? Aren't you glad you brought a friend today? <laughs> awkward. But listen, I get that it's awkward. I understand. But as the Archbishop of Canterbury said around the turn of the 20th century, I would rather have all of the risks which come from a free discussion about sex than the great risks we run by a conspiracy of silence. I understand this isn't a comfy, cozy topic. Imagine being in my shoes. The person has to talk about it. I've been sweating it all week. I understand where we're coming from, but I think this is so important. In fact, I think this might be one of the most important topics that we need to talk about because in our society, I don't know, it's, it just doesn't seem like we really focus on this, but it's such a big problem. And I think that in our culture, we kind of have the tendency of thinking, you can look, but don't touch when it comes to sexual content and things that you think about and look at. You can look, but don't touch. You know, what you're going to see Jesus say today is if you look, rip your eye out. This is what he's going to say. <laughs> We're going to talk about what does that mean? To What is Jesus? He's so drastic about this. Now, the reality is we all suffer with depression and loneliness and feeling like we're not good enough, inadequacy, and all sorts of things that make us feel like life just is kind of hurting. And so we turn to things to try to medicate the pain, to comfort, to, to kind of help us to, to escape. And we turn to different things whenever we're feeling that way. So what do you turn to when you're feeling lonely or when you're feeling depressed or when you're weak? Uh, last year, Brianna B. 1188 tweeted a list of scriptures that you could turn to when you're feeling depressed, upset, John 14. You're feeling lonely, Psalm 23, anxious, Philippians chapter 4. And a lot of people were like, this is great. And they screenshotted it and kept it and was like, maybe shared it with a friend. This is fantastic. Then a lot of people were like, yeah, I get it. But just being honest, I, I go to Taco Bell <laughs> when I'm feeling lonely. I go to Panda Express, McDonald's, Cinnabon. You know you're having a rough day. It's a Cinnabon day. Come on, you know the Cinnabon day, right? You're just feeling bad about yourself. And then George Molina tweeted that he likes to turn to movies. And uh, his list of movies here I thought was kind of, <laughs> Mamma Mia. You know you're having a rough day when it's Mama, or Bridges of Madison County. And then I loved Lexi's response here at the end. Was her, her choice was just pet my cat. <laughs> That's the answer for everything. So if you're a cat person, I'm sure you relate to that. But what do you turn to when you're feeling lonely and depressed and not feeling great about yourself? A lot of people, most of us, turn to sexual content. According to Online MBA, they did a class with a study, found that a, a, an average 40 million Americans regularly, 40 million adults regularly visit pornographic websites. A third of that number are women, so that kind of shatters some of the stereotypes there. And, but 70% of males between the ages of 18 to 24 visit a, had visited a porn site in that previous month, and that study was done in 2013, so I guarantee you those numbers have increased since then. You know what they found the most popular day to view pornography was Sunday. <laughs> so, so I'm doing a great job here. I'm going, you know, we're really making a dent. But, but pornography in our culture, maybe you don't even. What's the big deal? Because in our society, it's kind of seen like you know, it's harmless. You don't hurt anybody else. You kind of tend to your wounds and take care of yourself and kind of escape, and, and it doesn't hurt anybody else. The reality, though, if you go look at studies, it, it might not cause it, but there's certain a correlation, and I think it even goes to causation to say that it actually, when you increase those behaviors and those habits in your life, it increases loneliness and depression and hurt. It hurts real relationships. So the crazy thing is we turn, you turn to that because you're feeling depressed, because you're feeling lonely, because you're feeling weak, you turn to it. And then it leaves you feeling more weak, more depressed, feeling more lonely. 
That's how it can be destructive, not only to yourself, but it can also destroy real relationships. Not, not just current relationships. Maybe you're single. You're not married. You're not in a relationship with a, with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or anything like that. But I guarantee you, building those habits and training your mind to think that way can and will affect future potential relationships. Not to mention that behind the scenes of a lot of that content, you don't hear about it a lot, but there are people who are being exploited, who are being taken against their will into sex trafficking, all sorts of stuff that you don't hear about because they just want you to see the glamorous layer at the surface. So Jesus says, your sexual imagination can be just as destructive as having an affair that breaks up a family and causes a divorce. You say, really? So does what we look at and the way, more importantly, the way that you look at things, does, does it matter? Well, let's look and see what Jesus has to say. 2,000 years before the internet, 2,000 years before hookup apps, 2,000 years before erotic romance novels, Jesus said this. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said, it was said by God to Moses, who recorded it down, the first five books of the Bible called the Torah or the Pentateuch. It was the code of life. It told the Jewish people for almost 1,500 years what to do, what not to do, how to live. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is to have sex with somebody who's married. Or if you're married, to have sex with somebody that's not your husband or somebody that's not your wife. He, God is saying the, the way that you experience the most happiness, joy, and contentment is inside of a marriage with your husband, with your wife. So sex is not a bad thing. That's the environment within a marriage where you'll experience the most contentment and joy. It becomes really something that's good for your life. But if you really want to consider something that will destroy all of that, have an affair. So sex is not a bad thing. A lot of churches have really skewed this and really kind of tainted what, say, what sex is. But sex is a really good thing. I got five kids. <laughs> it's a good thing. God created humans with desires and instincts that often lead us, can lead us into a holy, a good sexual relationship. There's lots of content and teaching about this all over the Bible. In fact, just go read the Song of Solomon and I guarantee you you'll have some sparks flying in your marriage tonight, okay? But God's law says if you want to destroy everything that is good about sex, have an affair. An affair destroys families, marriages, livelihood, communities. It makes people live in comparison mode because they don't feel like they can trust the person that they're closest to anymore. Instead of simply enjoying their spouse, they're paranoid or they start to compare, wonder if they can get something better or a different person. And if you're single and you start to build content and imagination and, and habits into your life that kind of teach you to look not just towards one person for that sort of fulfillment, but you start to train yourself that there's a plethora of people that you can turn to or imagine or cope with, then that will damage your future potential relationships if that's something that you're interested in. What you do and see and how you see it and experience it and the habits that you build into your life right now are affecting and building into your future relationships. So God's law says, don't mess with that. Do not commit adultery. Don't sleep with someone's husband or with someone's wife or someone other than your husband or your wife. But I tell you, Jesus says in verse 28, but I tell you that anyone who simply looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Just with a certain look. You might remember several weeks ago, Jesus talked about murder. Do you remember that? If you missed that message, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. In fact, if you've missed any of the messages in the series, you can go back and listen to them on our website. We also stream these services every week on our Facebook page, Compass Church NRH. Go back and listen to those messages because they kind of build on each other. But you'll remember Jesus talked about murder and he said, whoever murders should be subject to judgment. There should be a severe penalty for that. But I tell you, anyone who is angry, it's as if they've already deserved that punishment of murder because they've already committed murder in their heart. You say, what? Well, he's saying murder, the core, the heart, the root is anger. And here he takes adultery. And he says, this thing, adultery that we see and it can be very destructive, it can destroy relationships. If you go to the core, if you go to the heart, if you go to the root of it, what do you find? You find 
lust. You find a heart that has turned to someone else and engaged in an imagination just by a look and by a desire and done something in the heart long before something physical ever happened. And so Jesus says, whoever looks at a woman has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Long before a wife sleeps with someone other than her husband, long before a husband sleeps with someone other than his wife, the affair begins in the mind and the heart begins with a desire. So Jesus says, if you look lustfully with someone, it causes you to stumble. We kind of go through this idea. This is a certain kind of look here because all looks are not equal. David, Averne David Abernathy said this. He said, this context connotes that the person goes beyond a passing glance to look continuously, not just viewing or imagining a naked body, but to lust after, meaning to dwell on it in lust and actually desiring to have sexual relations. The sin is not just looking, it's letting the look, because you have the ability to allow this to happen, letting the look incite a passion. It's not, dang, I looked, you know, I, I, I failed, it's over. No, it's I looked, I stared, I imagined, I desired. Now, one of the best ways to interpret the Bible, to interpret what Jesus says and what he means is by looking at other parts of the Bible and saying, okay, well, what does that mean? And that kind of helps us understand and how it works and how it comes together. It is very clear throughout the entire Bible that God intends for men to be attracted to women and vice versa. It's interesting. You look at the very beginning, Adam and Eve got this really interesting situation. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but in the garden, the original creation of God, we have Adam and Eve naked and they look at each other. They feel no shame. There's no sin. So God intended something a certain way that has changed now. And we start to see, well, obviously there is a way for us to look at someone and for it to not be sinful, for it to be appreciating their beauty or to be appreciating their handsome features or whatever it may be. But we aren't able to do that because from a very young age, we train ourselves and we train others and our culture trains us to do something very different than just appreciating beauty. We jump to, man, that's sexy or that's hot or that's arousing something that I desire to have. It's very selfish, very, very predatory, honestly. And, and the internet has done some great things, but one of the things that it has also done, it has taken exposure to that sort of idea and that imagination. The, the age has dropped drastically from where it might have once been. So from a very young age, you're trained to, to not think of people as a person or a sister or a brother or a friend, but to think of them as an object. That really messes with our brain and the way that we look at things. Jesus knew that, and he wanted to protect us from how destructive that can be. One of the biggest myths that we always hear, and I think we all know it's not true, but I think we try to lie to ourselves in the moment. The myth is that sex is just physical. Sex is just physical. That's not true. What a lie. Sex is not just a physical thing. It's not a physical need. I mean, food, that's, that's a physical need. If I, if, if I don't eat, if you don't eat, you're gonna die, you, gotta, you have to eat. And contrary to popular belief, without sex, you will not die. You will not die. It's not just a physical need. It is physical, but it elicits love. It perpetuates love and a feeling. So a physical act, it's this love, this idea that comes from it is, it's a feeling, it's an emotion, it's a soul connection that you have with somebody else. So sex is in the mind, it's in the heart, it's in the desire. And so Jesus knew that he wants to protect your heart. He wants to protect your feelings from how destructive that sort of lust can be. So Jesus says in verse 29, he says, look, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. We're going to have an eye gouging contest in a few minutes. You just, just prepare. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. Don't put it in a glass jar and display it. Hey, look, this used to be the thing that caused me to stumble. No, that's foolish. Get rid of this thing. Cut it off, remove it, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Right hand, right eye. These are considered some of the most valuable parts of the body. Especially in the ancient world, you think about the right hand, the, the right eye. They didn't 
I mean, for most of human history, if you're left-handed, people thought you were crazy, right? I, I write left-handed, I eat food left-handed, and I play sports right-handed, so I'm all sorts of messed up. It's just, it's just crazy. But, so maybe we th should think of dominant. Think of your dominant eye, your dominant hand, and all the things that you might use it for. In the ancient world, you think of a warrior, how you raise the bow, pull back the arrow, and you line up to find your target. You go look at archery lessons. I haven't taken them, but I just know they'll teach you. You really only aim with one eye, your dominant eye, and that's how you see. That's how you aim. And of course, you can't even pull the arrow back without the dominant hand. And that's how you get precise and you hit the target, just, just like that. And not to mention, like in the ancient world, there's not as much technology and computers and stuff. I mean, pretty much if you didn't have your dominant eye and dominant hand, you, it was a difference between having a successful career and a failed career from being able to make money and provide for your family and being a beggar. And, and that's, that's a huge difference to make in your life. And you consider about all the things that we do and we use our dominant hand for, writing, typing, cooking, playing golf, throwing a ball with a friend or with your son or with your daughter, playing video games. Those are really good things that make life enjoyable. But Jesus says, if your dominant hand or eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away, cut it off, remove it, because it causes you to stumble. The word stumble here is the Greek word comes from the root scandalizo. Did you hear the word scandal in there? That's where I think we might get the word scandal. This word means trap, not mumble rap. Trap music, you don't even know what that is. That's why you don't, it's probably a good thing you don't know what that is. <laughs> But this is like a cage that you get caught in. It's a trap. It's a pit that you walked into. You didn't know that it was coming and it trapped you. In fact, there's another noun that uses the same root that literally is talking about the bait. The thing inside the trap that lures you in. So you think the cheese in the mouse trap. That's, that's the idea here. Or the worm that's on the fish hook or the corn that's in the deer feeder. And it just goes without saying, I know this passage is talking about the other person, the person looking. It's not talking about the person that's being looked at, okay? But with the idea of bait here, can we just be honest and understand that some of you and some people that you know and some of us, what do we do? We use ourselves, guys and girls use yourself and your image to bait other people into lust. And so you post pictures of yourself or you talk about certain things or somebody's in a life stage, they just went through a breakup and a guy comes in and he kind of pray, he preys on this circumstance in order to trap and to lure somebody into a place of lust, into emotionally having an affair and to kind of doing this. And maybe you don't ever, I'll, I'll never do anything physical. This will never go anywhere, but they slide into the DMs and stuff like that. And you find real quick that you are honestly luring. You like the attention. You like to feel attractive because of this. You are baiting, you're using yourself to intentionally cause other people to lust. Stop it. You are not helping the situation. You should stop. But this scripture is talking about the person looking. And let's be honest. So many of us are stumbling into traps. You're getting hooked on bait and you know that it's there. Like maybe it was an accident at first, but you know, and you know how destructive it can be, but you've grown such a taste for it that you just desire it, even though you know that it's destructive, even though you know it'll trap you and it can destroy your life. Bob Russell was a longtime pastor. I couldn't believe he said this. I thought it was hilarious. He said, a man can ruin his life with an affair all for a three second muscle spasm. <laughs> That's funny. That is scandalizo. <laughs> that is a trap. And you don't even weigh out the consequences of what can happen. This word in Greek, scandalizo, also means obstacle. In fact, that's probably where it is more frequently translated. It's something that you trip over and it causes you to fall and to stumble. Like me walking through my house in the middle of the night because I got five kids and there's always stuff in the house no matter how vigilant we are to clean up. And my wife does an awesome job. I mean, she and I try to help and I, 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 we try to get stuff cleaned up, but doesn't doesn't matter. There's always something on the floor like the other night I was walking through trying to get to the kitchen to get some water it's pitch black and I kicked something pow what was that it's the Roomba 
Do you have a Roomba, a little robot vacuum? That thing just decided to stop doo -doo -doo, right there in the middle of my pathway to the kitchen. And I kicked it so hard, my toe is throbbing. And then I go back I'm in the bedroom. Man, my toe is hurting. I'm man crying, you know, that, you know what happened. And she says, you, th you think I had five kids. What are you talking about? <laughs> amen, I heard an amen over there. Here's what's funny is that I should know better than to walk through my house in the dark without a flashlight. And it's right here on my phone. I mean, are you kidding me? It's so easy. It, it, if I had just pulled out my phone with a flashlight, I would have known, I, I would have saved my toe a lot of pain in that moment. But don't we do that? We kind of stumble and fall into something like sexual sin. And maybe at first it was an accident, but then you build habits and it becomes a part of your life. And you start to desire things that you know are destructive. And instead of using light to avoid it, you purposely keep it in the dark so that we can excuse destructive behavior. But you're not fooling me. I know you're not that weak. You are a lot stronger than you give yourself credit for. And you're a lot stronger than sin tries to shame you and tell you that you are. I know that you can have victory in this stuff. That's why Jesus actually gives you a command here and tells you to do it because he knows that you can, especially with him as the source of your power and your strength. You can turn on the light. You can pay attention. There are stumbling blocks everywhere, TV shows, movies, apps, messages that you get from boys and girls that you've never even met. Stop stumbling into those traps. Delete the app. Change the channel. Stop staring at somebody. Bounce your eyes so you don't stare inappropriately. Stop walking by the man in the office that you fantasize about. Portia Nelson wrote an autobiography in five short chapters that she called, There's a Hole in My Sidewalk. I want to read it to you. Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there and I still fall. It's a habit, but my eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. In chapter five, I walk down another street. Walk down another street. Stop the subscription, cancel, delete the app, quit walking by the person that's causing you to stumble. Stop swiping right. Whatever it is, stop it. That's what Jesus tells you to do. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, if your right hand causes you to stumble, he says, gouge it out, throw it away, remove it. Do we have that scripture? Remove it, cut it off, get rid of it, throw it away. Think back to the idea of your dominant hand, your dominant eye, and all the things, writing, cooking, throwing a ball with your son or with your daughter, playing video games. Jesus says, those are good things, right? But they're not worth going to hell for. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw away. I know video games, you have to have a hand to play, but it's not worth, it's not worth this sort of results. And thank goodness this is a metaphor. <laughs> Jesus is not asking you to literally pluck your eye out and to cut your hand off or else we would all be blind and maimed. Like we would, we would not be able to survive this. But this is a metaphor because here's what we know. You don't need a hand or an eye to commit sexual sin. You can imagine that stuff. You can think it, dream it, visualize it without it even being there. But as Leon Morris points out, the drasticness of this imagery, this vivid imagery that Jesus is giving of, of cutting off the hand, of plucking out the eye, it emphasizes just how important it is crucial to take whatever measures are necessary to control natural passions, things that are natural, a part of who you are, but they tend to flare out of control to a place where it makes you a slave, it controls you, and you no longer have mastery over your life. Take the measures necessary to remove it. Now, this is not about shame and embarrassment. Do not 
walk out of here with your head low or feeling shame. Do not walk out of here mad at your husband or mad at your wife because you know what'll happen in that environment? You will create more shame. You'll create more loneliness and isolation. And what do we turn to when we feel shame and loneliness and isolation? We turn back to sin. Maybe we turn back to sexual content. That will not help the situation. You walk out of here ready to have victory and ready to show God's grace to others. Because thank goodness, God does not pluck out your eye. He does not cut off your hand. He does not condemn you and send you to hell. He instead sent his son to be crucified for you so that you could be saved from your sins so you don't have to experience that. So walk out of here ready to have victory, ready to take measures to say, I'm not gonna let this thing control my life. God knows that you have a power and ability that sin lies and says that you don't have. You have a power. Jesus knows that. That's why he says, cut it off. Remove it. Get rid of it. In fact, let's just say it this way. Don't just resist. Remove. Delete the app. Change the channel. Bounce your eyes so you don't stare at someone inappropriately. Stop walking past the person in the office that you fantasize about. Stop it. Okay, we're going to try something, and this is going to change your life. I want you to grab your phone and unlock it right now. You're, you're, I want you to do it. You're, you, don't, you think I'm playing? I'm not playing. Grab your phone. You're like, oh no, what's he gonna do? Grab your phone, unlock it, and go to your home screen, okay? I have an iPhone. I don't know how to do this on Android or smartphones, but if you have an Android or smartphone, you're probably smarter than me anyway. So you know how to do this, okay? I want you to find the app that causes you to stumble. Stare at your own screen. Do not stare at your neighbor's screen. <laughs> I see you staring at somebody else's screen. Find the app that causes you to stumble all right, here's what we're going to do. Are you ready? Even now, it taunts you and makes you feel shame. You're in church. Oh, no, they're going to know. Okay, here's what we're going to do. You ready? Tap and hold the app. <clears throat> Look, it's shivering in fear knowing what you're about to do. <laughs> it's shaking. A small X has appeared. This is the Achilles heel of your foe, okay? Tap the X. Pow. Delete. Boom. It's gone. Put your hands together. We just had victory. Fantastic. Celebrate. Come on. Do it again. Put your hands together. Celebrate the victories. Very, very good. I know we're having some fun, but listen, that was an exercise to show you what I have learned. I know that I'm a pastor, but I fight this battle every single day, just like you guys do. And what I've learned is not to just dwell on the failures, but to celebrate the victories and make a big deal out of it. You don't have to tell the world that you are struggling with temptation, but you yourself should really celebrate when you have victory. And you probably should tell somebody else and a friend, and you guys should celebrate that. If you have an accountability partner, somebody that you trust, a friend that's not gonna spread your stuff all over the place, but you say, hey, can we, have, can we just kind of be real with each other? Probably shouldn't be your husband or your wife because it's gonna be too painful. But if you have somebody that you say, I need to find somebody that I can be real with, let me tell you what, don't just dwell on the failures with that person. Don't just sit around, oh man, I failed, I did this. Yeah, I want you to confess, I want you to be honest, but if you just dwell on the failures, you're gonna feel shame, and then you're just gonna give them notes on how they can sin. They're gonna be like, oh, you did that, okay. You know, but I'll do that later. You know, you're just luring them into the trap. So don't just dwell on the failures, focus on the victories and celebrate them. What have you done to remove temptation from your life? Way to go. Tell that to a friend and celebrate it. Where have you had victory with this and success? Way to go, celebrate that. And most importantly, what are the things that you're doing to invest in your own personal self-care so that you don't feel as weak or even desire these things as much? That's very true. If you go talk to counselors and therapists and say, I need to get help with this, you know what they'll tell you to do? Not just remove stuff, but to start investing in your own heart and your mind so you don't feel as lonely, so you don't feel as anxious, so you don't feel like you're in a weak place and of inadequacy and paranoid and worried. You need to invest in your own heart. Build yourself up. And then specifically, what are you doing to invest in your marriage? What are you doing to invest in your husband, to invest in your wife, so that you are so relationally and so emotionally connected with the person who can actually fulfill your sexual desires in a healthy way that brings contentment and true freedom. People think that freedom is out in a place where you just get to experience this with so many people. That, that will not experience freedom for you. You will very quickly experience 
destruction, things that entangle you and tie you up, feelings of inadequacy and comparison all the time. There's so much more freedom in simply experiencing that in what God asks you to do. He said, I want to protect you from all that. Invest relationally, emotionally in your marriage. That's an important thing to see and to do. That's the way to victory. You cut things out, remove them, and then replace them with things that will actually alleviate loneliness, anxiety, and feelings of inadequacy. You remove digital, imaginary, false intimacy and replace it with real intimacy. And guess what? It doesn't even have to be sexual. In fact, I think most of the women in the room would prefer that it wasn't. They want relation, deep conversations, honesty, real, worship. Worshiping God. If you wake up in the morning and just start your day meditating, contemplating God, reading scripture, filling your soul, you're gonna have something where, where that emptiness is filled. You, you actually get to a point where you overflow and you will not desire those things as much. You'll be much more fulfilled in your life. Relational depth can start to fill the void before it ever even empties. Now, if you're not married, I can't tell you how much this is important for you. I know that we've just talked about the outlet of being married and maybe you feel really frustrated. You're like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm not married. This applies to you in a huge way because there are things and habits that you're building into your life right now that not only are frustrating you and hurting you and destroying your self-image now, but they will really destroy the ability to have a future relationship. If that's what you're interested in, you don't have to be. But if you would like to get married someday, what you're doing right now and the way that you're building into your brain, looking at others instead of focusing on one person, you start to build that into your habits, that will not change when you get married. You will not be satisfied. You will not be content. It's different. I promise you. Andy Stanley says it this way, and this is what I think you really need to focus on. Become the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. And maybe that means that you need to stop dating and you need to get rid of habits and behaviors in your life just so you can detox off of toxic relationships and people who have sent you pictures and just preyed on you and taken advantage of the whole situation. It's just been brutal. It's horrible. We live in a toxic culture for relationships and how you should actually experience those things. It destroys people. So just take a break and focus on becoming the person that the person you're looking for is looking for. Here's the reality. We don't talk about this enough. Jesus was single and was his entire life in ministry. And so was his, one of his top apostles, Paul. His entire life was single. Mary Magdalene and a whole list of other people. We don't even have time to list them all out. All the people who chose to live a single life and that actually enabled them to serve Christ more faithfully. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And I really want to encourage you, whether you're married or single, this afternoon or this week, you need to go read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It's going to open up a whole can of worms. And you're going to be like, what is that about? You need to go read it and start to struggle and chew on what Paul teaches in here. But he says some things that are totally countercultural to what you often hear in our culture and what you often hear in the church. Like he says, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a gift from God of one kind or another. If you jump to verse 34 and 35, he says, a married man, a married woman has to think about their earthly responsibilities and how to please their wife. An unmarried man, an unmarried woman can spend his or her time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. Their interests are divided when you're married on a woman can be married as well, but their interests are divided on, fle- on pleasing their husband or their wife. I say this for your benefit, not to place restrictions on you. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. That's why he says, I say to those who aren't married and to widows and to widowers, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn with Lust. What will help you serve Jesus most effectively? Because if you're married, you won't be able to be as free to, to go and to, to do ministry in some ways. You'll, you'll have responsibilities for your wife and with your kids or with your husband. But if you're single, you, you can go. You have, you have a higher ability. You have a more, more, more ability to relate to who Jesus was because he was single. But that fire and that burning, that starts in the heart, in the mind, in the desire. And you need to take measures to say, what am I going to do to take control of that? And if that's something that's dominating your life, you can take control of that. There are lots of ways to grow in this. 
And this is only the start. After the service today, we'll have pastors and some team members at Next Steps. And if you would like to stop by there, and if you feel comfortable, you don't have to, but if you feel comfortable, just confess and say, you know, this is what I've done, but this is what I'm gonna do to have victory in my life. Would you pray for me? Because I really need God's favor in this. We would love to pray for you. And nobody's gonna throw stones at you. Nobody's gonna judge you and, and say, get out of here. You're actually gonna experience grace in that moment. And that fear that says, oh, I can't tell, I can't tell, you're gonna share it and you're gonna bring it into the light and God's gonna forgive you and you're, it's gonna lose its power. It's, it'll lose its power over you. Now, maybe you feel like, Luke, this isn't really my struggle, but there's something else you wanna take a next step with in our church. Maybe you're interested in becoming a member or being baptized, or you would say, you know what? I wanna check out the Discover Compass class. We have a little card at the Next Steps area that you can fill out and lots of little boxes you can check there. And we also have on those cards, a box you can check for his story coaching and counseling, Stephen ministers, people that you can talk to and say, hey, I need help in whatever area of my life. Stop at Next Steps before you leave fill out one of those cards and I'll get those and I'll help you connect with those next steps in this coming week. But you are not as weak as your sin tries to tell you that you are. And you do not have to submit to the cultural norms of our society. We can be different and we can truly live in contentment and in freedom, happy, even in this area. There's a pastor in Colorado named Jim Bergen who actually knew back when he worked in Kentucky, my brother was his worship leader like 20 years ago. But now he's in Colorado and he recently started a new podcast and he shared a video on his Facebook account this past week. And I was just like, this is powerful. I wanted to share it with you guys. Take a look. It's powerful. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you have not plucked out our eyes and condemned us and sent us to hell because your grace is not dependent on me, my faithfulness or the faithfulness of anybody in this room. It's dependent on Jesus alone and what he did for us. And so I pray that you would help us to live in freedom as a result of our time today and that you would bless us with your presence and that you'd give us victory over the things that have lied to us and told us that we're a slave no longer, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, that I pray. Amen. Would you stand with us?